we get bachelorettes and birthday parties every night. Um, you know, we get older women. I mean, there are women, you know, last night, for example, who's an 83 year old woman in the audience. That's awesome. And, yeah. And then, you know, and then we get the 21 year olds who are celebrating 21st. And so we, you know, we span the gamut when it comes to demo. Uh, and of course these are women from all over the country. So, um, you know, you never know what you're going to get on any given night. Uh, so it's always, uh, you know, it's always fun hosting the show. Hey everyone, this is David Stark from Watcher Pass, and today I'm joined by Jean-Claude Lamar, the star of the revealing documentary Black Magic Live Stripped. We're going to talk to him in just a second, but first let's check out the trailer, and while you're watching, if you can like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. It helps me out a lot. Thank you. We are the only all-black male review show in Las Vegas going on four years now. It was a first. Uh, running a black male review show, here you're dealing with big, buff guys who have an ego. See, our guys, this is life for them. The women who buy tickets, welcome your sexuality. Your sexuality isn't taboo. We're not afraid of you. The hundreds of black women lining up the strip to come and see this black male review. People always told me, you should be a stripper, you should be a stripper, because of my body. Um, when I was like, I'm all right. My biggest thing was just getting out of poverty. Like, I was tired of going to stay hungry. I've danced for every profession, I want to say. I danced for judges, I've danced for nurses, I danced for cops. Body is coming down to wear and tear. We are very much a family, um, and that's a good and bad thing. Yeah, we're not always so strict. I'm not always straight and narrow. I laugh, we joke, we, we share stories. Black magic is a family. It's, 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 they there for you. Well, we might bump heads with the guys, but we're going to be family. Family. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Jean-Claude Lamar, the star of Black Magic Live Strip, which is a revealing documentary about the, I guess, the only all, all black male review show in Vegas, right? Or at least it's at least the yeah. longest running. I think it's the only one, correct? Correct. It's the only one. Wow. That is that is fascinating. Um, so I guess, you know, the, it's an interesting documentary. It's it's maybe, uh, you know, a, a topic that maybe not a lot of people have known, you know, know much about or have, have experienced. So I guess, what was the inspiration for the creation of this documentary? Like what what, uh, what inspired well, the, you know you to, you to go and kind of document this this endeavor that you had? Yeah, I, I, I thought, uh, well, first of all, you know, I directed a, a couple of years ago a movie called Chocolate City, which was sort of a, an urban take on Magic Mike. Uh, that movie did really well in the, you know, limited uh, the specialty box office and then went on to have a uh, really great afterlife in, in the ancillary television, streaming, all that stuff. Um, out of that came a reality show for Lifetime Network about this world. It was a docu-series, eight episodes for Lifetime. And on or about that time, when we launched, you know, the TV show debut, we started a live show business in Vegas. And, you know, in the three years of doing the show, I started to notice some really interesting things about not just, you know, uh, the show's presence in Vegas, but also, you know, the lives of the dancers and how transformative being a part of this show was for them. So I decided to document it. I, you know, brought on, I produced it. Mm -hmm. I brought on a, um, a documentary filmmaker and, uh, you know, he and I collaborated to put this together. Well, that was interesting. Uh, you know, I was going to ask about the fact that you know, you're not listed as a writer and director, but I imagine you were heavily involved. I mean, you, you have an extensive film background. So did you just want someone maybe that was more like uh, in the documentary world or had done that before so you could do the story justice? Or, or that's, was this... that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I come from the scripted uh, film world. And so, you know, um, it's a very different, I mean, it's both narrative features, but it's a very different, um, you know, experience shooting and filming a documentary uh, in terms of pacing and in terms of um, uh, the length of time it takes to film the documentary and the structure of the documentary to make it a you know something compelling and you know people want to watch and so he you know Jason Horton is a you know pretty seasoned he had done I think eight or nine documentaries before he and I uh, talked about doing this one and so you know, we brought him on board and, you know, he was able to capture 
uh, the vision that we had for this particular documentary. I'm just going to say, if if you have a hard time making a compelling documentary about you know very attractive men stripping for your target audience, then I think something's wrong with it. Right. <laughs> so right. I feel like that's a very easy subject yeah. to be, you know, <laughs> to make compelling. Yeah. Um, so I love I love hearing the stories of the of the performers. Uh, you know, I guess did you did you pick and they were all very different. So did you pick specific performers? Did you just interview kind of the gamut and just use, you know, what was you know, what kind of yeah. fit with the structure? How, how did you go about selecting who would be on screen well, and, and their the, stories? The, the, yeah, the core of five guys that you see in the doc, featured in the documentary, I've known for some time. So, you know, I was able to watch their transition, their metamorphosis uh, in terms of, you know, uh, becoming, you know, they come from a lot of these guys, very unstructured, um, you know, homes and, and, and very broken families. Some were incarcerated. Etc. And like I said, uh, the, the core of the documentary, the subjects I've known for some time. So I had a sort of a, uh, I thought their story, their stories were more uh, what I wanted to share with the audience. Um, you know, their trials, their tribulations, and, um, you know, what this show means in their lives. And I love I love the kind of the uh, the diversity of their backgrounds, right? Because it didn't feel like there was any one path to becoming a performer on the show. It felt like you know everyone had a very different story to tell, and they all kind of came to the show for different reasons. Um, you know, I guess is that just kind of how it is with a with a show like this? I mean, Vegas is kind of a transient place. You get people from all over, and then also you just there's there's no set way to become a, a performer. It's it's just kind of you know you have you have a skill set, and then it kind of translates on the stage or it doesn't. Is there so that, yeah. That's correct. That's correct. I, you know, Vegas is an interesting place. I mean, there are, first of all, there are about five male review shows here, m m all white male review shows um, on the strip. And our show was a little different because, you know, most of our dancers, as you point out, are not natives of Las Vegas. They're transplants. So the, these guys, you know, moved out from Las Vegas, from uh, L.A. to Las Vegas and just to be a part of the show. And, you know, a lot of, a couple of them have sort of brought, relocated their family uh, to Vegas as well. Some have children, wives, et cetera. And, um, you know, they each bring something unique uh, to the table. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we feature, for example, Loverboy, who's sort of, you know, um, on the, the declining end of the hill, right? Um, he's, you know, on his way out of the game, as it were. And, uh, you know, he's struggling with transitioning and trying to figure out how he, you know, what he does from this point on, um, you know, and then we have, you know, like Trophy, who's one of the youngest dancers who actually met his wife, um, you know, during one of the, the shows, the performances. Oh, wow. huh. And, uh, you know, they met, they got to know each other. She actually lives here in Las Vegas and um, uh, they got married. Uh, a couple of years ago and going strong. So, you know, there's all these different, you know, you had, um, for example, Silk, who was a, uh, on the Olympics trials team. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a boxer and, you know, th because of an injury, uh, wasn't able to, um, you know, fulfill his Olympic dreams. And he decided, hey, you know, I'm buff. I'm, I'm you know, I know how to move. Um, and I don't want a standard nine to five job. And so he, he joined us and, you know, and they all have really compelling, interesting stories and lives. And I thought this would be a great documentary. I like how you described uh, Loverboy as being on the other side of the hill. Uh, although I imagine like, you know, he seems to, he seems to know that he has to kind of keep his, his game, his, his level of, of performance high because of that factor. I imagine there, is there, I mean, is he, do performers age out or is there like a, like, can you have like a silver fox performer as long as they can kind of do everything that they need to do? I, 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 well, I think, look, you know, at the end of the day, the median age of our, of our fan base, our customers is about 35, mm -hmm. 40. Um, you know, if you have a performer who's in his thirties or forties, I think, you know, look, even, you know, the early fifties, I think it's, it's, it's feasible. I think, you know, you could get to that. It's not like basketball, um, but you know, there does come a time where you, you've, you've aged out, um, and you can no longer, 
sustain the workload. I mean, it's a lot of work, a lot of uh, impact on the body. Uh, dancing for a couple of hours. Sometimes we do two shows. And um, yeah, so you start thinking about how you're going to transition. A lot of these former dancers either, um, you know, start their own, you know, small business. Uh, some go into personal training uh, and some even go into management where they, you know, create their own shows and, you know, put them up. So th there's, you know, different ways to transition out of it. I like Terry and uh, I love everybody described it, you know, where he's kind of, he recognized that he, that he was, had to keep his game up. You know, it, it was very much like a sports analogy, like a you know veteran athlete kind of looking at all the uh, the young rookies coming in and trying to take their spot. And I, I thought that that was right. a very apt analogy mm -hmm. and also very appropriate for the, you know, the, yeah. the type of physicality that's required. Yeah, yeah. And kind of along the competitive sports angle, I also really like seeing, you know, it was competitive because everyone wants to get on stage and like a sports team, there's only so many starters, but I also really loved how supportive it was. It seemed like everyone was there for a reason and kind of were or helping to prop each other up, whether it was other performers or other people that worked at the show and management, like everyone seemed to be in it for, for like the family aspect of it. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that this is certainly, um, one of the reasons that, you know, our show is so important in the lives of these guys. Uh, for the most part, you know, when we first started, it wasn't that camaraderie was not there. You know, you're putting, you know, five guys who essentially, you know, you could term them guys from the streets uh, with all their machismo and bravado, uh, sharing a locker room and trying to entertain women. And what our shows taught them is, listen, you make more money if you work as a unit and work as a team, um, at the end of the day, you know, the show is one entity. You are parts of that show. And so, you know, it took a lot of work with them to really change the mindset and get them to a place where they do not look at each other as competitors, but as comrades. Yeah, no, definitely. But that's, that's so important because like you said, it's, it's all about the show and you want, you know, you don't want people out there kind of getting aggressive with each other. Everyone's there to have a good time. So that's right. Um, so one thing I was wondering, you know, the, the film did focus a lot on the performers, which I think is, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the main focus of the film. Uh, but I was wondering, you know, I, I kind of wanted to see maybe like a set just to kind of see what it was like or kind of see how a show evolved. Uh, is there more footage that was cut from the documentary? Is there, and the, the double entendres are perfect for this. Is there going to be like an extended cut or a, a bigger cut of the film? Is there anything well, like that? Let me, let me tell you what's interesting about that. You know, when we sat with Lifetime to discuss the vision of the show, um, I wanted to, I wanted to do a docu series, um, that basically mirrors mirrors the um, the documentary you just watched. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. That's the that's the uh, docu series that I thought would be successful. Lifetime <laughs> argued against it and wanted to do a documentary more in the fashion of what you just expressed, which was, hey, uh, let's do a, a, uh, every episode uh, deals with a dance routine, how it comes together, the costumes, the, 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 you know, and having gone through that experience with Lifetime a year and a half before, that's not the documentary I wanted to make. I didn't think it was you know, you could always see a show, you know what I mean? It's like, I didn't want this to become a concert DVD, right? Um, you know, where we just see the performances and how we put it together, et cetera. Um, you know, having, like I said, because I did that a year and a half prior and it did not work, coincidentally. <laughs> it did not work. Believe it or not, people's <laughs> fascination with wanting to see a show uh, quickly wanes after, you know, one episode, you yeah. know, after you know, they're like, okay, are we going to see the same thing every week? And, um, and yeah, it doesn't, you know, nothing really changes. It's the same thing. Um, but I thought, you know, them sharing their lives, their struggles, the obstacles that Las Vegas, uh, uh, presents and, and the, the, the obstacles that the dancers have to overcome, uh, to find a place where they're settled uh, in this show was, for me, a more compelling uh, story for a documentary. 
And you know what? You've done it both. So I'll, I'll take your word on which one was the, the more compelling documentary. And it was a, it was an interesting documentary. I was just kind of like, yeah. I'm curious how the, all these pieces fit together in the right, actual. Right, right. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, the, I guess the obvious question is how, you know, th this is a live performance. Like you kind of have to be there to to experience it. How has, you know, the last year and a half affected the show? Is there, did it shut down for a little bit or is it always yeah, just, it, you know. Yeah, we were shut down for a year and a half. Oh, wow. Uh, show came back up actually about uh, three and a half months ago uh, to sold out audiences. I mean, it was, we were, you know, really packed to the rafters. Um, and, you know, during COVID and the lockdown, we had to go online. Um, you know, we did shows via Zoom, uh, Instagram Live, uh, we were very active in that space and found that the audience uh, was, you know, very, very engaged during that time. We got, you know, during COVID, we managed to get more fans of our show than we did before uh, before COVID. It, uh, that doesn't surprise me, though. You know, people are locked down. They, they're looking for something fun to do. And right. also, this could be, you know, I, I bet there is a little bit of maybe hesitation if if you have never been to a show or don't know what to expect. So maybe this allows them to right. experience it from the comfort of their home. So that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you were able to pivot like that because I, I know that this lockdown has been kind of devastating for lots of live performances yeah. and shows and things like that. So, Yeah, some, some shows permanently closed in Vegas and, you know, could never return. I mean, you know, uh, Cirque du Soleil filed Chapter 11, uh, you know, bankruptcy. And, and uh, yeah, you know, Vegas shows took a big hit during the pandemic. Well, so thankfully this, this show is still around um, and it's coming on, it's premiering on September 1st then it goes to virtual cinema on September 3rd and then it goes to uh, VOD on September 7th and then DVD on September 21st. So there's plenty of yeah. ways to see this very interesting documentary, thankfully. Right. <laughs> um, so now I'd like to switch to, I call it the lightning round. This is very short, lightweight questions about things okay. that happened in the film. I want to see how your experiences map to uh, things that happened in the film. Uh, okay. you, know, you can feel free not to answer if you don't want to answer any of them. I try to keep oh, them okay. answering. <laughs> okay. uh, so the first question, and probably the most shocking uh, thing that happened in the documentary, has anyone ever bitten your penis uh, in a show or some sort of performance, I guess would be there. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I just to, to be clear, you know, I host the show. I don't dance. Okay. Um, so I host the show and I've, you know, I've been obviously groped. And, you know, people come towards the stage and, you know, women throw stuff at you, their bras or whatever have you. Um, but I no, I know foreplay has experienced, you know, being bitten on his penis by, by a customer happen. I mean, you know, they're drunk. They're drunk women that are, yeah. you know, having a great time. And, you know, sometimes they get beside themselves and, you know, do stuff that's a little, you know, off. I think that was that was good for the, the shock value of it, but then also is good to kind of frame like you know you, you always expect at like a strip club you know male customers will be more aggressive, but it was good to frame like look like females who are out there having fun who want to experience you know experience the show can also get aggressive. So I thought that was like a you know, yes it was, yeah. Um, so I guess the next question you know do you have you, you don't perform, but do you have like a signature move that you do when you're I'm seeing or any sort of like signature look that you go for when you're up there or do you just kind of well I'm all yeah well I've got you know I've got the bow tie with the you know the sparkly jacket and you know uh, the French cuff pants and uh the women love it they love that 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 look the sharp clean look um a bit nerdy so it doesn't feel intimidating <laughs> at all um and um you know yeah there is a segment in the show where I do a little you know a little two-step the ladies really, you know, respond to that. And oftentimes they'll run up to the stage and, you know, throw some dollar bills at me. It is, you know, a tipping show, meaning, yeah. you know, it, it, and it's only a tipping show uh, because we want to keep the ladies engaged and involved in the experience. And, you know, why go to the strip club if you can't tip? Yeah. Um, but it's not obviously mandatory, but it's, it adds to the experience. Um, I guess the uh, other question is, are there any 
type, you know, favorite kinds of crowds that you like? Do you like it when there's like a bachelorette party there, or is there like, like a well, birthday we get party? bachelorette? Yeah, we get bachelorettes and birthday parties every night. Um, you know, we get older women. I mean, there are women, you know, last night, for example, there's an 83 year old woman in the audience. That's awesome. And, yeah, and then you know, and then we get the 21 year olds who are celebrating 21st, and so we, you know, we span the gamut when it comes to demo. Uh, and of course, these are women from all over the country. So, um, you know, you never know what you're going to get on any given night. Uh, so it's always, uh, you know, it's always fun hosting the show. Oh, definitely. And the last question is, so the film is called uh, Black Magic Live. If you had a magic power, uh, what, what would it be? If I had a magic power? Yep. Um. I think the ability to, the ability to heal sick people be a pretty cool superpower. Especially now, that would be yeah, that would be very be a pretty is, cool superpower. And that is very socially responsible of an answer too. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, it's it's such a powerful skill set. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I mean, doctors obviously, you know, but if you had the power just to, you know, be able to touch someone and and like, oh, you're no longer of HIV or you're no longer have COVID or you no longer have cancer. That's just, I, I, you know, that to me, it would be a, an incredible superpower. I, I think we would all appreciate that. So yeah. <laughs> I guess keep working on it. Um, yeah, yeah, so keep working. <laughs> the, the, the film is out next month. Um, you know, I imagine you're going to be promoting it and then also promoting the show that's, that's, that's live. Is, uh, are there any other yeah. films kind of in, in the hopper? I know you've been, you have kind of a prolific uh, career. So I imagine there must be something else that you're working on as well. Yeah, well, I, you know, I just, I just wrapped a musical. Well, not just wrapped, but pre-COVID, I finished a musical, uh, which was my first musical film, which I was pretty, I, I loved the process of, you know, recording in the studio, bringing in the artists and the singers, and, and then, you know, uh, you know, dubbing it during, during uh, the scenes. And it, it's just a really fun, uh, uh, immersive experience. And, uh, you know, it's sort of heralded back to the day, West Side Story. And I know Steven Spielberg is a new version that's coming out soon, Christmas, I think. Um, but there's nothing like filming a musical. That was pretty cool. I and mean, it was on my bucket list. You know, I'd done, you know, a romantic uh, drama uh, in the very similar to Fifty Shades of Grey called Kinky which came out across, you know, nationwide on like, you know, 600 screens. I uh, didn't do as well as I'd hoped. Um, so I'd done that. You know, I'd done a comedy, a broad comedy. Uh, I'd done a, uh, a, West, a couple of Westerns. Uh, in fact, David Carradine's last movie, I directed him in um, a Western oh, wow. uh, before he died. Um, so a musical was like next on my list. Uh, I was <laughs> like, I got to do a musical uh, before it's all said and done. So that's, uh, yeah, I did a, I did a musical. That's awesome. So cross that off the list. Yeah. And uh, so you can check out yeah. the musical sometime in the future, but next month you can check out Black Magic Live Strip. So thank you so much for joining me. That was Jean-Claude Lamar talking about Black Magic Live Strip, which releases on at a special LA premiere on September 1st in virtual cinema on September 3rd on VOD on September 7th and on DVD on September 21st. So there's all sorts of ways you can watch this very interesting revealing documentary. If you liked this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel. It helps me out a lot. Make sure all my new content goes straight to you. Thank you. Thank you.